your comments. Yeah, thanks for joining us as well. Glad you enjoyed the film. Lovely comments. Good to see some of you here. Um, and that, thanks also for the comment about the sound as well, um, Joy. That was why we did it through Vimeo as opposed to through Zoom. But we do have a little, another little clip in a minute. Rainbow back to Carnival, which we will we'll show. But we should probably start, consider this to be a start, given the first bit was just really an introduction. So should we start, should we do another with, at this point, um, Christelle? Remind people why we're here? On the whole. Oh, are you, are you, shall I carry on? Because you're muted, you're muted, so. All right, I'll carry on, I'll carry on. All right, so. Uh, I'm back. Sorry about that. Okay. Just welcome back, everyone, and uh, really nice to see all your comments that you really enjoy the, the documentary. Um, just to, to remind you, everyone, um, the short film was uh, done by Firstborn Studio, which is uh, Rob is the producer and Sean Stubb is the director. Uh, and we've been just joined by Toussaint Clark, who you might have seen in the film and who is a member of the Rainbow Steel. Toussaint, thank you so much for coming to join us today. It's really appreciated. I know you're really busy at this time of the year as well. Um, so thank you. Um, for, there is a Q&A uh, at the bottom. So if any of you have any question that you'd like to ask Toussaint or uh, Rob, can you please put your questions in there? Uh, I will start, I'll kick off um, by asking the questions myself, um, but please keep, um, get the question coming in. Um, also, if you know anyone um, who's not on Zoom at the moment, but would like to join us, we are streaming live on, on Facebook. So please direct them to BSWN uh, Facebook page and they can follow us from there as well. Um, so today is really in the context of uh, Samples Carnival because uh, Saturday is normally when the carnival take place, but because of the pandemic, carnival is canceled this year. Um, and also it's in the context of um, the cultural heritage project that BSWN is involved and in, received funding from the uh, heritage lottery. And I really thought that the rent was still uh, orchestra was a very good example of how to illustrate what is cultural heritage is um, and also in the context of carnival you know we cannot have a uh, steel band with, well we cannot have carnival without no steel band so for me that was just the obvious reason and that's why I contacted Rob to say let's you know let's screen your film so I'm really glad that we have uh, to send here today but I know it's all about carnival and I know Rob has got something to show us because um, I know that Toussaint and uh, the rainbow still was at the first uh, Samples Carnival back in 1968. Um, so I don't know. Bob, are you ready to show us what you've got to show I us? I think I am. I mean, okay. for the film, which we'll talk about rainbow, the film in a minute, I definitely want to think, thank Chris Barnett and Lois Delphinis as well, who must be acknowledged for Chris Barnett's edit. It was amazing. And Lois, you remember Lois Toussaint, who held that together as well. But for this little clip here, I want to thank Colin. Thanks for, thanks for joining us, Colin, as well. Great honour to have Colin. Who, um, welcome, Colin, and thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for facilitating us to have this clip. But most of all, thank you for making this film in 1968, when, um, when Colin Thomas, who was at the BBC then, and he made this film called uh, Celebrate What About St Paul's Carnival. I'll say no more about it for the minute, but I will share my screen and play you some clips. Firstly, it will be um, a five minute clip and I'll, I'll just play it through the, the share screen. It'll be a five minute clip and then a couple of clips afterwards if we can find the steel pan again. So uh, here we go. Saturday in the middle of an English summer, the people of the St. Paul's area in Bristol put on the parade of their first festival. 
It rained all day long. The immigrants arrived poor. They went first to where the houses were the cheapest and the schools were the oldest. They went first to St. Paul's. The children of the Irish, the Italians, the Greeks had come here before them. Now the children of the West Indians, the Indians, the Pakistanis arrived. Less than 4% in all Bristol schools, yet more than 60% in some of them. Here they begin the slow, painful process of adaptation to a society very different from their own. What do you do? Right, I'm clapping my hands. All right. Good. Stop there. Are you clapping your hands now? What did you do? I clapped my hands. Is that right? Yes, it was. Good. All right, you clap your hands. Stop. Are you clapping your hands? No, we are not. Very good. What did you do? We did clap or we clapped? We clapped our hands, isn't it? All right, let's try you again. We'll see a scene. I want you to describe that scene in sentences, please. Write complete sentences. If we can write a complete sentence, then we're obviously making much better use of the English language, rather than just putting one or two words. Our festival has two... I'm just going to stop that there a second. Um, go play a little bit more in a minute, but I know that. Uh, can you hear me all right? Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I can hear you. I'm just yeah, going to stop that. Um, I was going to play a couple of bits more, and I will play a little bit more in a minute because Colin will probably kill me because he went through a lot of trouble to find <laughs> the corrected version, and I've just played the wrong version of the film, which the corrected version got better quality. So I'll come back to it in a minute when I when I clip it up, but. I wanted to stop there a second because I was going to just jump forward after five minutes anyway to start showing you a few clips of the steel pan. But I'll see if I can still find those, but with the better quality version, okay? Because I was you got the flavour, which is what I wanted you to get a sense of for that. Could maybe play a little bit later. So, yeah, so Colin, sorry about that. <laughs> um, as a filmmaker, when you've made, gone through a lot of work to get every frame right, every 25th of a second, you hate it when things mess. So I'm going to jump forward to a little bit of a rainbow clip. So there's one at eight, set eight minutes twenty, or I could pick up. I could, I'll tell you what. I'll pick up from three thirty, where we left it just now. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to share my um, screen. Do you want us to start the interview for now? No, no, no. Let's carry on. I'm going to we'll just get the clips out of the way, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll, um, we'll just go straight through with the interview. Make sense? Okay. All right. I, I'm just going <laughs> yeah, to. Let's back try again. Play back the few bits for two minutes and then jump to the two rainbow clips and then we'll stop that and come back to the discussion. Yeah? <laughs> Thank 
Okay, it's really hard to stop that film at any point. I, I did a very bad job, of course, of queuing it up and everything else. I'm sorry I started playing the wrong version of it. You can see how much better the quality is. Um, it's very hard to stop that film. That every time a new scene comes, you want to watch it. So I'm sorry to disrupt you, disrupt that for you. But I just wanted to get um, those bits. In. Colin, apologies for not showing the right version. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I think you are muted, <laughs> so I don't think anybody heard anything. <laughs> ah, what was muted? Oh, the whole film was Found. muted. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, I didn't see that. I'm so sorry. Well, you saw the visuals, right? <laughs> you saw the visuals. I don't know if we can play it again later. But the point of that clip, there was a, there was a number of things going on there, really. I think mainly the first part was to put Two Saint and Rainbow Steel at the scene of the first carnival, which mm. that was the film that was made back in 1968. 
the other the point I wanted to get across really, um, which maybe lost in the distraction, was that the film Celebrate What uh, and the filmmaker took a very socially conscious look at the thing. So it was really about the conditions that people were living in St. Paul's at the time and the need to re to rethink about their, their culture, to, re, to acculturate to something very new. And it was trying to look, look at the challenges of that, which I thought in the nowadays and days of Black Lives Matter, coming out of the BBC from white men at the BBC, I thought that's very progressive thinking. So I think it was really, I wanted to disrupt that idea as well. Do you know what I mean? So that was fantastic. I think that's a wonderful piece of work. And I'm really sorry to show only clips of it. <laughs> But say well, let's um well let's hear from Tucson. Yeah, thank, you, thank you so much again for joining us. It's really an honor to have you here with us tonight. Um, so you were in the back of the truck on that first St. Paul's Carnival. So my, well, my yes. is, how was that? And how old were you? And well, I, I was about 10, 10. Oh. Yeah, it was about 10 when that was on. But this is the first time I've seen, there's normally another clip that is shown at this time of the year. Um, I, I believe it's from the BBC because I was at the, that was an open bed, flat, flat bed truck. Because I was the youngest, they kept me at the side, at the top end, so that I didn't fall off the truck, you see. <laughs> so like, they were filming it from, that, from down the truck. So that's why you don't see me on any of the shots, but I'm there at the, at the safety side in the truck, like, you know, and I remember it well. This is the first time I'm seeing some of that footage, but it's taking me right back. I know what we were playing. I know it was raining. I know. <laughs> oh, good job. You knew what you were playing. I'm sorry about the muting, everybody. <laughs> to that. Yeah, put it on a string, man. <laughs> so who were those yeah, people in the truck? Who else was there on that truck? Uh, it was myself and Hallam. They, I mean, that was the Barbados All-Stars that was playing there at, at that. And it was myself and Hallam. Um, that's all that was on that truck from the current band that we now have. But there was Clyde Chase, there was my dad, um, Harry Gill, there's quite a few faces, uh, Lionel, there's, there's quite a few, the regular Star Wars of the band at that time, you know? Tell, tell us about Hallam. Who's Hallam? Well, Hallam's the boss, the big boss. He's the big <laughs> godfather, he's the man. <laughs> he's the one, he's, he's out of that gang. He's the first one that actually came to England. And he ended up, well, as you've seen in the documentary, he, he came to England. Before them, he, um, he actually went to work in Western House or somewhere like that. And just to kill time on night duty, he, he made himself a pan because he had nothing else. So he, he tried to get back into what he, he had left behind. And so he made this pan. And he then got friendly with a guy, as the story tells you. He, he, he got friendly with the... Um, the warden at the YMCA here in Bath. And, uh, and the guy asked him what it was that he had, and he, started, he explained to him about Pan, adding on, well, if you think this is good, you wait until you hear a band, you know? And then he contacted my dad. Again, there was no mobile phones and things that we'd be used to nowadays. I mean, they were all conversing by letters and that sort of thing. and then. The band themselves are back in Barbados. Their side of it is telling me, well, they 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 they, they got in contact with Hallam, and told him that they were coming up to England just on tour, basically, but no intention of staying. They were just coming on tour, and take it from there. Well, yeah, that were... tour lasted for about five years, for <laughs> <laughs> minimum of five <laughs> years, because they were only, you know, that, that. In fact, for some of them, it lasted for fifteen years before they could actually get back to the Caribbean. You know, so, but luckily, we're, uh, for the ones that are still alive, we are still in touch. It's still, I mean, I've just left Casa uh, and, and um, Keith and some of the others that are on that truck. I've just left them two months ago when I, when I was in Barbados. Yeah. So do you, have you, so that was, by 1968, um, the band would be eight years old. I mean, what do you aware was the connection to St. Paul's Carnival? Because that was the first carnival, wasn't it? How did you get yeah. connected? Are you aware of that? Well, back in those times, I mean, there weren't very many live bands here in the Southwest. I mean, the steel band was was a major thing within the Billap community. And I think that the, the community groups were more together. Bath and Bristol is only 12 miles apart. So, you know, you know, like, like, like 
they know us, we know them. And there's a strong link between um, like my dad and Hallam and Henry and Prince Brown and all that crew and Tony Bullimore at the Bamboo Club. There's a whole link between that, that crew. So in ter if when you're talking about live music, until the, some of the reggae bands, the Untouchables, and some of the bands that started to come out of Bristol in the late 60s, until then, it was pan. You know, and even when you start talking sound systems, there, were, there, there wasn't very many. I mean, it, I think it was Tarzan, was it probably Tarzan and maybe Ajax, apart from that, there was none. But from all these institutions and other things evolved. Other bands, other say, other uh, reggae bands, other, well, no more steel bands, <laughs> but um, yeah, the reggae bands, and that, 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 that was it, so. That's, that was our involvement. Yeah. It was just live music, live Caribbean music. You mentioned um, the Bamboo Club. Can you tell us about a bit more about that period of time? Yeah, well, I mean, that was that was the focal point. I mean, I can remember playing in the Bamboo Club Christmas 1969. <laughs> and <laughs> just amazing. Some of the friendships that we struck up then are still in existence today. Some of the guys from Sebastian's own system, Sebastian himself, some of the guys from Studio 17, uh, you know, Tony Bullimore himself, Hank, there was, you name it, a lot of the friendships are 50 year old friendships that evolved from the Bamboo Club, from Playing Pan, you know, and thank God they're still, they're still thriving today. And th you said you remember that, let's go into that, back, back to that first day again. Again, you said you remember it well. What do you? What else do you remember about that that first carnival day? Uh, well, as I said, I can remember the it raining. I can remember some of the girls that are in the procession behind. Some of them are lifelong friends, Sonia Dixon and um, Elaine, and there's a good few of them that, that that actually lived in Bristol at that time that have migrated to Bath and now live in Bath. Like you know, so again, I knew some of them before they even moved to Bath from that first carnival. And how long did you play for us at St. Paul's Carnival? Because I, can't, I haven't seen you in the recent carnival. Well, doing that, that was, there, were, there, there was no, as now you would have sound systems on the road and that sort of thing. There was none of that. It was the steel band was the main thing on the road that led the procession. The girls were the dancers in that procession. The sound system came in, that was a static sound system, and they would normally be playing where the Malcolm X is, no. The procession would go kind of from there and come around in a circle and end up back there, and that would be a kind of, I can't remember the name of the school. Is it John Cabot or something like that? I can't remember the name of the school. Uh, isn't that St. Barnabas? St. Nicholas Saint or St. Barnabas. Barnabas or, Barnabas. I can't remember the, the actual name of it, but the building is still it's, there at the, behind Cabot. the Malcolm X, yeah. as it now stands. So that's where the sound systems would be and the, the after thing. But yeah, the actual possession, we would just play and just keep playing because that's, that's the only thing that, that, that was going on. So you just play and play and play. And, and what else did you do um, on that day? Because the, the, the film of the 68 event is 25 minutes long. It's looking around the whole community. You get some clips of the pan as well. But the general sense, it's a very dreary, rainy day which um, you know is doesn't match up to expectations is the feeling I get. But I mean, you were ten years old at the time. What did it mean to you? Yeah, well, for me, it it, it, it met my expectation because I was able to go and play with the big boys. <laughs> they were playing a tune that was like on top of the pops all the time because it was a tune by Sandy Shaw called "Puppet on a String." So that was an adventure for me to actually learn that tune and learn it well enough because they were very, very strict people. And there was no way if you weren't up to scratch that you could even enter into the practice place. So for me to be able to go on the lorry and play with them and be part of that, that was just amazing for me. So that's, and then to actually do the, the procession and then go to the big boys place, which was where um, Tarzan and the sound system was playing. And I could go and have a lemonade or orange juice or some sort of refreshment. They were all drinking, mind, after, after playing on the float. But for me, I was able to actually partake in that, have a soft drink and, and whatever. So my whole experience to Carnival, that is my whole baptism into Carnival. 
And how long did that go on for? That was 68, but we know it's not. Still, that was St Paul's Festival, 1968. Oh. We now have St Paul's Carnival, which is a slightly yeah. different thing, um, 2020. And the relationship between Steel Pan and Carnival, certainly in Bristol and the Southwest, even though we have Rainbow, which is an international institution, the relationship is not really there. How has that kind of evolved from 1968 to now as, as you see it? Well, as I see it, back then, as I said initially, we had, there was a close link between Bath and Bristol and the community groups and problems. Everybody sort of knew each other and, you know, like in, in terms of booking Rainbow Steel Band or Barbados All Stars, it was, everybody was on first name terms and we got on and did what we had to do. But over the years, that has dwindled. And I mean, I'm not sure what is, what is actually going on in, in Bristol now in terms of carnival. I mean, when you phoned me on Monday, where did you find me? You found me at the Yar Centre in London um, in another carnival institution working out another carnival problems. You know, you know so, and again, I, I really do believe it's like the personal contact that is, is needed. But that was lost over the years. Between the, I mean, between the, 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 the current steel band and people who are on the St Paul's Festival Committee, let's say. What about, sorry, Christelle, please jump over me. I was going to say, well, I think this, well, maybe BSWN need to come in because as, um, as part of our project, this is maybe it's something we need to revive that kind of relationship between when we're still and maybe simple scar levels. So that is something we need to explore a bit further. Is there any suggestion in your part of how we could move this relationship a bit forward in the future? Well, I just think we should just do it. I mean, it's, it's not a big deal. I mean, to be quite honest, honest with you, I'm a carnivalist. So <laughs> on, I know that is on the first, on the first Saturday of July, it's St. Paul's Carnival. That's been, as I say, that was my baptism and that's been it for me. However, with the loss of um, connection, let's say, the carnival would be going on. And if we got contacted at all, it would be very last minute. So by that time, you know, we were an economic institution. We, we, we might be playing at a wedding or something else. But really, I want to be playing at St. Paul's Carnival. So yes. on Carnival Day, Sometimes it might be that we've got three gigs mm. at the places. And I, luckily, St. Paul's Carnival was one of the few carnivals in England that would go on late. So I might do all my three gigs elsewhere and still get back in time to pinch a little bit of carnival and touch, you know, touch base with my friends and, and whatever. But mm -hmm. really, my spirit and my heart would be in being on that lorry, being at the front of the procession and doing what I did in 1968 and through the 70s and through the 80s and through the 90s, that's what I would really want to be doing. So when did that start to thread, to fray, to fall apart? How long were you, would you say you were playing carnival? Uh, how many years? In fact, yeah, when did it stop being a thing? Um, it just kind of dwindled away, I think. And I, I, I can't really tell you a, a definite time. I know we were still doing it in the 90s um but definitely in the year 2000 right i mean we might have still done one or two around 2000 2000 and but not as a regular and on a regular basis and the, the, the problem with that is sometimes we'd be contacted but it would be very late in the day you know and you know, by then we've got another gig we can't fit it in i mean for me i'd always be bullying Hallam to try and let's juggle because i really want to play at a carnival like you know what i mean but again, you know, it's got to match up. The economics has got to match up. And like in other cities where we're doing carnivals and, and, and this sort of thing, sometimes carnival isn't just about the procession. It's about sometimes we're doing workshops lead up to carnival. You know, so like the, the broader community, the kids in the schools, they, 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 they've got an understanding of what this is. And I think the last time Bristol did that effectively with Rainbow involved, they had Peter Minchel over from Trinidad making the costumes. And to me, that was one of the best carnivals that St. Paul's had because it was like the real thing, the whole big costumes and the kids were able to partake and the color schemes and the way he would um, actually 
as we as black people do get the best out of limited resources and for me to be on that float and look back down Grosvenor Road and see all these turquoise and pink and all these sort of color coordinated and it was thousands of people coming back going down there you know made up of kids made up of, 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 of community groups all all sorts but it was well coordinated and to me that was the best carnival that i played in in st paul's you know the structure of it even maybe the tune that i can't even think what tune we played that year but everything blended in everything was right you know and that was that was my best experience in Bristol. who's peter menschel he's one of the top um or well, i'm not even sure if he's still alive but he was one of the top um mass designers from from trinidad with all the costumes and whatever so he was commissioned in i'm not even sure who was in charge of um st paul's carnival at that time it might have been francis or one of the trinidadian posse that were involved along with alfredo and them back at that time i can't really i wouldn't like to say who was responsible for it but obviously they had the connection to be able to get him over from trinidad and get the workshops going and get this whole thing to happen you know so i may yeah. also sorry yeah, now I was going to say, when we spoke on, on Monday, um, you were in, in Notting Hill. Um, yeah. um, so I was quite interested to find out a bit more. And I know I've seen you in Notting Hill Carnival. And I also know you've won uh, the competition, the steel competition there three times. So yeah. I, went, I was quite interested to find out a bit more about um, the state of the steel uh, in, in the UK, but also internationally. And I know you're part of the, the British Association of Steel. Yeah. Uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about that. Well, um, coming for, if I, if I think back to how it was in the sixties, in terms of, I mean, there's so many different developments. Don't forget, it's a very, very new instrument. So like in terms of the technical side, the tuning side, which is what I'm also into, it's still developing and it's developing globally. And um, one of the good things that has happened within the last 10 years, there's maybe eight tuners, steel pan tuners in this country. And up until 10 years ago, we were all friends, but we all did our own thing independently. And then we realized it's better to share the knowledge and, and work as a team. So like 10 years ago, we started the U uk pan tuners guild so we all work together share knowledge and so we've got actually got a, a guild that's a recognized guild and, and well right now we're going to affiliate some other guilds that are all to do with music and crafts and and whatever and that initiative is being taken on in trinidad and again some of the tuners from trinidad are involved or want to become involved in in the guild so it's it's an international organization and um, playing wise i mean there's pan on every continent um <laughs> back in 1968 dare i say it particularly here in the southwest it would have only been black people that you're saying playing pan but no you got all every everybody's into it even tonight i've just sold a pan to a little a, a, a white a little white guy and he's just taken aback by it and you know, and just his demeanor, I know he's going to make it because he, he's, he's, got, he's, he's got this passion for it. And it's a similar passion to what I, I've got for it. And straight away, as soon as I met him, we clicked. So I know he's, he's, he's going to go far. And again, I'm here to help him. You know, and the team I've got around me are here to help him because people helped us. So, you know, that's how each one teach one. So, you know, that's how we go. So Pan is on, it's on the rise, definitely, big time. Uh, the the um, connection between Pan and Carnival around the UK or around the world, how does that work? And is that different to Bristol then? Um, how, how do you um, think? Let's, let's, say, let, let, let's look at the, the, the actual state, local. local. Um, as I say, it's, it's the, it's, frustrating for me because Pan was at the forefront of Bristol Carnival and when we had Carnival here in Bath, Pan again was at the forefront. But now I'm finding that it's a, it's a back number. And as I say, that is extremely frustrating for me because for me, 
Pan is carnival. Carnival is Pan. <laughs> it's all interlocked. It's, it's, it's all one and the same. You know, one of the initiatives I always wanted, I mean, I've never been invited to sit on a panel in Bristol, you know, but one of the initiatives that I've always wanted to try and initiate in Bristol is Juve. Now, Juve is the procession when you've only got steel pans. Now, they've initiated it, they've reinitiated it back in, Bristol, in London. So after Panorama on Carnival Saturday, that probably finishes at the latest 12, 1 o'clock. At six o'clock in the morning, the steel bands come out. So you can imagine when we've just won Panorama, there's no <laughs> sleep. We just booze in and we're doing a we party in, and then we've got to come out and get get straight though, and, and you, you've got to come out and play in a procession at six o'clock in the morning. That procession goes on till probably ten o'clock in the morning, just around Notting Hill, just steel bands, no amplified music. Just steel bands, and you've got the mud revelers, you've got the people that are leaving the sessions and the nightclubs, they're coming out onto the streets. So carnival is kind of starting at six o'clock in the morning, really. You know, this is the unofficial start. So I've always wondered, well, because Bristol has a, a, had the late carnival and the frustrating time on every carnival that I've ever been to is when you've got to shut off it's just a flashpoint and it's been, you, you, you just got to shut off. And the thing is, it's got earlier, particularly in London, it's got earlier and earlier and earlier. And when, you, when, when you're on that procession and all of a sudden it's shut down, that's the flashpoint. That's when things start to go wrong and, uh, and whatever. So, but Bristol was kind of lucky because they were, they were able to go on to quite late into the night just until recently. And it's only because of certain, um, incidents that have happened that, that you know it's been curtailed back and back and back so my initiative was always i wonder how it would work if you did juve in the reverse if they had juve starting at say 12 o'clock you had this procession starting in not in um in st paul's at 12 o'clock just pans and taken everybody's still reveling but you're taking it away rather than you just stop the music dead and everybody's just there and it's a potential flashpoint. So that, I'm not sure if he, even if it is viable, but it was just my thought of how, because I've been there when Carnival has been shut down and it's just shut down. And it's just a very frustrating time for all concerned. I'm sure it's frustrating for the police who've got to, who've got to come and deliver that. And it's frustrating for the punters that have got to receive that. And the sound system just shut, everything's just shutting off now. So like that, that was my kind of take on it. I wonder if you could start a procession late at night, which is pan, and everybody just chilling and everybody just vibing and enjoying themselves, you know, so. Could you explain what Panorama is, please? Well, Panorama is the uh, steel pan competition. That's where the, the top 10 tunes in Trinidad, the uh, Rangers will pick one and the band leaders will pick a tune and they will basically show off with it so music if we're talking music now that tune could be a simple three chord tune but they will take that and turn it into a symphony and with lots of different movements and whatever so it's a competition so you have bands even here in england you have bands now breaking 100 players in each band you've got that happening in england now you know and um, that takes place in London as well, in Notting Hill. Again, that's another well-kept secret because it's only within the last couple of years that you can go, well, for me, coming, out from, coming from Bath and coming into London at Panorama time, which is carnival time, you can see loads of posters on the tube and you see it everywhere about Notting Hill Carnival, but you don't see any posters saying anything about National Panorama. And that's, I think last year might have been the first year that I've come into, come into London and seen National Panorama and there's a whole bigger thing surrounding that. So that competition takes place, um, normally there's upwards of maybe six, seven, eight bands um, taking part and those bands come from all over the country. I mean, Real Steel take part in it from Plymouth. 
as I say, they've won it three times. Um, you know, you've got Ebony and Metronomes, Mangrove, um, and then you've got bands from Coventry taking part. You've got bands from, you know, basically all, all, all over that take part in this competition. You know, so. And they come to London on the Saturday before the Bing Carnival Day, is that right? Yeah, again, the difficulty with the bands, the bands in London are always safe. Like the, the bands that have got to travel in from out of London, then it's accommodation and accommodation in Notting Hill at that point is quite hard because everybody's in for carnival anyway. So and when you've got to put up a band of 100, where are you going to put them? <laughs> you know, it's, you know, so it, it gets quite, quite complicated. So wherever possible, we will try to get in before the Saturday because obviously on the Saturday to get the players up to London, get the floats set up, get everything set up, run through the tune before you know it, it's performance time. So it's probably better if you can be there two or three days before, you know, get acclimatized to what you're going to do and then you go. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, what is the, sorry, Christelle. No, I was going to say, I, it's a special time for me. When I go to Notting Hill Carnival, I have to be there for Panorama. I really, I really enjoy that, that part of the, the carnival. For me, it's, Carnival hasn't started if, you know, if I haven't seen Panorama on the first few days. Um, but I know it's becoming very, very popular. Like you say, it's a, it used to be quite secretive. Yeah, did find out where it's happening. But yeah, now it's very popular. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's my highlight of Carnival normally. <laughs> well, the, the good thing with, um, with the Panorama is because there's a lot of pan in schools and in community organizations, and most of the shooters are part of the carnival panorama scene anyway. Most of them will be highlighting the fact that, well, this is what we're doing on this particular day. So you get quite a lot of students, people from Newcastle, people from Manchester, wherever. They're all flocking into London, if not for carnival per se, for, um, for the panorama, which is good. It's, it's completely diverse. So that's the UK's national steel pan kind of Super Bowl. Yeah, <laughs> yep, exactly. Okay, so um, got a couple of questions actually. One, what do we have in Bristol, steel pan wise? What do you have? Um, there's uh, Cotton. Cotton School's got a band. Bristol Cathedral School's got a band. Um, there's also a band in Thornbury. Uh, there's a band, I'm just trying to think where else. Um, I think there's one in Porter's Head. I haven't been out there for a little while, but I think there's a band still in Porter's Head. Um, I think that's about it. How many can uh, have? Pardon? Are they all in school? Are they not, are they all linked to school? Yes, they're all schools based. The band in Thornbury has just branched out because they've been going 25 years. So they've just branched out away from the school. It's more like a community type band now. But up until last year, yes, it was still based in, in the school in Thornbury. And we have nothing locally. So where is all the next generation of Caribbean, African Caribbean, that kind of thing? What do we have in St. Paul's is another question. Um, what do we have in St. Paul's? Um, now, how much is pan being taken up by black community or communities, I should say? Um, well, it hasn't. Bristol. I mean, I, I'm renowned for what I'm for what I I do, and I think a few years ago, when I say a few years, <laughs> it's a lot more than that. It's maybe about forty years ago or so. Um, they tried a project in Trinity Church. Now, Trinity Church has got its own connotations in Bristol and within the black community in Bristol. Yeah, but the project was based there. And a guy from Coventry, one of my fellow tuners, Victor, he came down, made the pans and whatever. But then he went back to Coventry and it doesn't seem as if it was um, viable. Hang on a sec. What's happened there? Okay, yeah. Somebody, somebody. It, didn't seem, it, it didn't seem like it was viable to him to. Yeah, yeah, to be obviously to be up and to be up and to commute 
to do the lessons. So they, they contacted Hallam and Hallam was doing the lessons over at Trinity Church. And I know like at that point, a good few of the players that later became Ekami, they were play, they, they, you know, they, they were all involved in that initial project. This was back in but, the 80s, okay. when was, when was this? This must be this, back in the 80s. This is the late 70s, this is the late 70s early 80s, before, probably before Ekami was, was, was formed or alongside Ekami being formed. Mm. Rob, so can I, Rob, can I come to you because you've also got the question in the um, uh, the chat. Um, because we were talking about the film that uh, Firstborn has made. Can you tell us a little bit more why uh, Firstborn decided to make that film? Uh, but also, is there any plan um, after COVID to show it to a wider audience? <coughs> well. No specific plan. That would be good. I mean, there's a good question, isn't it? I mean, COVID brings a question, what is a wider audience? I mean, we, we don't need post-COVID plans for a wider audience. We could do an international screening. Um, however, the, the underlying question I have for myself is, and it would be wonderful, when can we get together and have a screening? You know, the cinema experience, you know what I mean? It's that kind of togetherness feeling, the, the mob. Anyway, so, but it would be great to do something. Maybe we could do something in Bath or maybe in Bristol. Maybe we could tie something, I don't know, back to carnival in some way who, who knows um but there's no specific plan no um i mean also you see it's there sitting there right now on on vimeo so this occasion of all of us coming together thank you for doing so is an opportunity to screen a film that's already been released if that makes sense but obviously what we're hearing from two saint that's the unique bit here which and the film gets us into two saint you know its story as it were so i mean i think this is is great to hear i'm sure we could do a probably a series, we could do a box set with two saints in Carnival, I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, but so it's a good start, even just thinking about the relationship between Bristol and Carnival. Why do we make the film? Well, Sean, the director, did a great job once again. Um, um, he, Sean Sobers, he, and this is relationships again, back to two saints point. Now, Sean um, brought up Bath, everything else, Barbadian himself, like two saints, like everyone else, like, not everyone, like, unlike, um, I don't know, would Bristol, I mean, Bath has a very strong Barbadian flavour. I noticed that being Barbadian myself, which in Bristol you don't really get. It's very Jamaican flavour. And I'm sure there's Jamaicans everywhere. But, um, but Bath has a strong Bayesian element. Even listening to Two Saint talk, I hear my family, my background, my heritage in that. So I don't know Two Saint from Adam, but I hear him talk twice and we're already family. Likewise, I mean, Sean literally grew up with those guys, right? So and he's known Steel Pan, and also, as Toussaint was hinting at, and as Sean said several times, the community was held together by that. So there was cricket, wasn't there? And other things that came out of the fact that you were a community. And I think that's a really good point I'd like to touch on later about, you know, role models in the community and what holds the community together. Um, but why we made it was, um, the, the, the Steel Pan was 50 years old. There was heritage money again, heritage, thank you, heritage lottery, um, heritage fund again to mark that cultural heritage. And Sean having a relationship with Rainbow and I think might be neither asked directly or might have known about it or helped bid for it or said, hey, we should do the story, I don't know. But I know since then we've said a million times we should do more, we should do an update. It's 15 years, I mean, even say 15 years, like I'm, I'm still thinking it's like 10 or something, you know. So um, we, what, what, the way we approached the film as well, I mean, it was a 50th anniversary, but the way we approached the film is you can see that they're set in those tourist locations in Bath, those key, if you were to do a postcard version of Bath, that's how it was. And that's how we wanted it. So that we were trying to position Rainbow as a major cultural institution in Bath, just like the Abbey, just like everything else. And um, that's why it's played out that way. And I think that's the attitude. I mean, it's like Colin's attitude for his film. It's a very strong attitude in that film he'd taken about St. Paul's Carnival. Our attitude to to, to, um, to Rainbow here was that they're underrepresented as a cultural institution. They're not underrepresented, they're undervalued as a cultural institution. And that is also by us, Bristol, by St. Paul's Carnival, by Caribbean children, you know, by myself, who why am I not, why Pan not central to my existence or whatever, you know? Um, so we wanted to add value back to that, I think. That's, that's why we made the film. And as you can hear, um, and I'm really glad we made the film and just to hear those stories, because I think Two Saint would tell you when we first started knocking around, talking about film, film, he was happy to help. Like I said, he has a relationship with Sean, which relationships count for everything. 
as you've heard about relationship between carnival and rainbow um so he had a relationship so it was just talking about it was like, yeah okay okay but it wasn't until and two cent would admit, I, I, i'm only saying this because two cent said it to me <laughs> but two cent would admit this not until after the film done you think wow why didn't we do that before or when we're going to do another one or i see what you mean now because some of these people have passed on and the story in some of the story might get forgotten it was an opportunity to dig out those photographs and as the film is like a wine you know it does actually mature with time you can really start to appreciate it so even you know, watching Colin's film and being able to hear Two Saint bounce off the back of that is a real precious moment for me anyway, do you know what I mean? So why we made it then and it was definitely to mark the 50th. And but if I look at it now, I think we kind of, um, I'd be very disappointed if we hadn't made it. I think the main underlying purpose was to say Rainbow and is a cultural institution in Bath that's undervalued and is one of Bath's cultural assets, just as important as um, Jane, uh, as um, Jane Austen. Jane Austen, <laughs> Jane Austen brother. <laughs> Is there any plan to do uh, maybe a ten years follow up from? Fifteen. Fifteen. Oh, well, it's more than ten years. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is well, there any plan? For me, for for me and First Bunny and Sean, well, we don't have any. Well, we've been saying since we finished that film let's do something else, right? You know how it is, life gets in the way. And this is probably where collaboration, nudging networks are really important because if we're being asked this question every five minutes, then maybe we would have done something by now. Um, and resources, resources are quite important. I noticed um, you mentioned, in fact, one of the questions we had in as well, do you know when that Hinshel, when the, what year that, that person was, Tim, Tim Minshall, Peter Minshall? Do you know what year that was? I can't. I can't remember. Okay. It's got so to be. That, that was, it's got to, as I said, that's got to be. That's a guess. Eighty six, eighty seven. Okay. Mid eighties. I, I, I okay. Would. Because I suspect that resources, value, and in fact, one of the things I've noticed is, and I've noticed. I think this in relation to still for Rainbow specifically. One time back in the nineties, when I was knocking around Kumba, two things actually right, absolutely right. I've seen it on the other side. We might mention Rainbow. And in fact, the first time I came across Rainbow, we were doing Black Pyramid film and animation, Joy Will Be, and Mindell Bowen was producing it. And um, Hallam came and played a solo pan, Hallam Eiffel, back then, and in about 99, 2000, that's the first time. But anyway, so in Coomba, for example, with Carnival, I don't think that at any point, Steel Pan was in the same way, like, if you tried to take Notting Hill, Steel Pan out of Notting Hill, there'd be a riot. Well, there wouldn't be a riot, but you know what I mean. It would be an issue. Is, right now, if you probably try to put steel pan into St. Paul's, it might be an issue. Because, for example, the price. You come and you want all those people, all the transport, all the rest of it. And because we haven't said, OK, that's absolutely central to the programme, let's budget for it. By the time you come back, as Two Cent said last minute, um, it's like, oh, well, that's, that's too expensive. We can't afford that. But what I see that as, it's not about the money. It's about the value. and the Because obviously, if it was like... Rainbow, absolutely central to Carnival, can't do Carnival without Steel Pan, that we have to therefore have twice the money, whatever the thing is. The point is, it's always about reducing the money, reducing the money rather than increasing the value. And in relation to how and why we made the film, I think that's probably what I'd like this conversation to summarise around, if you like me, not that we're summarising now, but is around the idea of what value, do we appreciate the value we have in Rainbow? Two Saint mentioned, I'll shut up soon. Two Saint mentioned a couple of things which are quite significant, but Two Saint is very modest, you see. He's not going to sell himself in this way. Robbie Joseph in the film, um, he said, what did he say? He said, um, to, well, he said Rainbow is an institution, but also he said that um, world recognized. He's a world recognized pan tuna. We don't know that. We don't know what we've got in Bath and Black South West Network, I think, is important personally that reason here to do this and bringing Bristol and Bath together in that way but we don't know that we have to go to London and get Robbie Joseph to come and tell us that he's an institution that Two Cent's an institution um Two Cent talks about the UK Pan Tuners Guild and the British Association of Steel I mean these are two important institutions in the national picture you know which will need support because I think it might sound big but I bet calling a meeting and I'm just guessing this from been involved in other organizations calling a meeting getting people to come on time take the business stop arguing with each other <laughs> like any human you know we're trying to get humans together it's quite difficult so the british association of steel sounds big 
but is it well supported? Is it structured? Is it robust? You know, if two saints falls out with the person next to him, will the organization continue? I don't know the answer to these questions. I'm just throwing them up in the air. But I think all those, do we value, do we put enough resources into what these things? And do, you know, I think, like, like I said, HLF thankfully supports these things, these small projects, because it values heritage itself. But do we value steel as an art form? Do we, as Caribbean people, value that as a cultural asset that we have? We rather, I think, this is me being provocative now, look at all the white kids that are picking up pan and complain about cultural appropriation than go and try to learn and get our own fellow children into it. That's how I see it. And that's me being a bit assumptions, making assumptions or whatever you call it. But it's that kind of maybe, thing. Maybe you can ask too, Sam, what, um, <laughs> what is take on that one? What, what, what do you think? Is, um, oh, I'm on mute. So. I'm going to go on mute. Oh, you're on mute. So, um, yeah, to say what's your takes on that? What's the next generation? Is it going to be more the white um, children who are picking up still rather than the black children? Well, for me, I don't really differentiate between if you're, if you're into music and, mm -hmm. and you really want to do this thing, I don't care who you are. Just come and do it and, and we, we, we try our best. Um, I would like it to be a lot a lot more black people you know i i was one of the last because i i was brought up in in that whole 60s time in which we are revisiting some of the scenes that that i grew up with with martin luther king being shot and with black power and black consciousness and muhammad ali coming on the telly and making me proud all these sorts of things i grew up with and basically if I, I would I would like Pan to still be one of the beacons mm -hmm. for black people. And I was one of the I was one of the last of the tuners to or tutors to actually go out there and teach it in the schools because I was from that I was from the belief that this is a black art, this is a secret, this is something that we should keep. And to be quite honest with you, when I when I started teaching in the schools in the late 80s and teaching pan it became quite fashionable because they could realize well hang on a minute you can actually you've still got to do the rudiments of music but you attack it from a different way and you can get a result quite quickly in pan as a lot quicker than you would with a violin and some of the other conventional instruments but you end up at the same point but it's, as i say it's just a different way you just go around it in a different way when a lot of the institutions up and down this country actually saw that happening, then a lot of them invested in PAN. So, uh, you know, it, it, it was difficult for me to, to think, well, all right, I'm going to go into the school and I'm going to teach PAN. But at that point, a lot of black music still wasn't being played on the radio. So the beats and a lot of the actual thing to actually give you the proper essence and make anything that you're going to do authentic to a class, let's say. Not just a class of black, a class. Black, white, whatever. It was very, very difficult. Because to keep it authentic, we want a little calypso, a little soca, a little reggae, a little, like, like that, that, that sort of thing. But if you're not hearing that in the mainstream, how then do you teach that to, in, in, into a, a white school when you've got all these offbeats and these different things going on? But thank God, over the last, um, since then, over the last, let's say, 35 years, there's a lot more black music and that music has integrated. So, like, even for somebody to DJ, to be able to DJ and DJ on the offbeat, if you're any good and you, you've got to ride the rhythm on the offbeat and that sort of thing, well, a lot more white kids can do this now. And because of that, I find my job of actually going out and teaching in, in, in a school a little bit easier now because the general music that they're hearing now, whether it be rap, whether it be even, even the English type beat, it's still got a little bit of a soca kick on it. it they're, they're trying to come our direction. So because of that, I, my job's a little bit easier where I can get a result in a school, in a class, a lot easier. And it's close to authentic, or at least I can see that I can actually get it to where I want it to be at some given point, as opposed to back in the day, <laughs> you're fighting a, a kind of losing battle, you know? So I think just world music now has changed sufficiently enough to embrace Pan 
and I mean 50 Cent has, has embraced it, and a lot of like, like musicians in other genres have, have embraced it. So it's there, it's there for the taking, really. So how can we bring Pan back as a, this is probably, this is quarter to nine now, so we're probably on the kind of wind down zone at this point, aren't we? This is, this is us gathering our, our kind of metaphorical steel pans together <laughs> late on Grosvenor Road, metaphorical Grosvenor Road, or would it be the A4, somewhere between Bristol and Bath, as we get, start to get the crowds out of town now, very slowly with your idea, your innovation, your inverse juve innovation, to say. <laughs> so how do we bring, add value to, or how do we, in, sh, I, I, the value's there already. How do we increase the recognition, I guess, of the value we have in PAN, in, in, as in, a, in as far as cultural heritage is concerned, a very important African Caribbean tradition, um, which is for everybody um, in the Southwest. How do we build on that uh, now? Uh, uh, how can we build on that? And um, so I just want to put, will we we'll come back to the questions, the Q&A stuff in a minute? We'll come back to you in, in, at the end. Well, if you're asking me that question, Rob, the answer is dialogue, <laughs> right? Dialogue, because there is no dialogue. Dialogue, the music that we play is dialogue. Yeah, everything is dialogue. Um, there is no dialogue. So the minute we open up dialogue, and that is not just me talking, it's me listening. And the, and the other people that could be in the, in the forum, talking and listening. And open-minded, we will get there. So long as they want the dialogue. If they want it, it will happen, you know? Christo, how does the intangible cultural heritage thing, um, if we could even get our mouths around that, how, how is it, has there been any insights for you as you've been having this conversation about how we could use the project or, I mean, whether or not you don't have to get through management and trustees and budgets, budgets and trustees and management and that aside, I mean, are there ways you imagine in your ideal vision for how the project could work, should work, that we could use the project to well, I think the, the dialogue, like Tucson said, is really important. And I think he has to start from there. And I think a project like the Intangible Cultural Heritage is maybe a place to start that dialogue. You know, it's a way, it's a, it's a perfect platform to bring people together to have a discussion. You know, we could have a follow up to this. I know we are, we've only got a few, 10 minutes left, but we could have a second time with this, but also maybe bring carnival, uh, some more carnival uh, team members on the platform and discuss how we could move forward together. Um, yeah, I think uh, to some this right, dialogue is uh, the best way forward. And do we have to look, how do we look around? Because I know, Tusa, you said earlier, I, wanted to, I was tempted to correct you, but I shut my mouth. You said, the, one of the big things for any carnival you've been to, I said, actually, you probably mean any UK carnival you've been to, because you've been at carnival around the world. How does Steel Pan fit in a, a, a carnival around the world? And what can we in Southwest learn from that international connection? Just dialogue. That's what we, <laughs> I am moving off a of dialogue. Dialogue. <laughs> it's late, right? You know what <laughs> I mean? If I, if, now, for instance, what, what, in all seriousness, if I'm traveling around, and I see something that I think can benefit us here in the Southwest, well, it's for me to bring it back and bring it and have that dialogue, you know, and we take it from there. But if, if I'm seeing all these things or somebody else is seeing all these things and there is no dialogue, well, it don't, it don't really matter. I think once we start to talk together, if you remember when we were talking just now, when at the beginning of the, the, um, the, the film, particularly the film that Colin did, and you were asking me about life back in, in the 60s and, and whatever. One of the things that came out of that was the actual dialogue that they had between Bath and Bristol and the community leaders in Bristol at that time and the community leaders in Bath at that time, whether they be playing pan or cricket or running the bamboo club or whatever, there was a link between them and a dialogue. Everybody knew each other on first name terms, you know, and this is where we need to get back to. And, you know, uh, and, and just deal with things from the grassroots level up. Hmm. We've got um, a comment and uh, to follow up from that earlier question about um, doing something after COVID. Um, I just read the comments. Surely still pan is the best way to get together and a socially distanced way to make music as a community. What do you say about that? 
Well, yeah, I totally agree. Well, funny <laughs> enough, you should say this. Um, we played at Hallam's house because none of us had seen him during lockdown. He's 90 years old. None of us, he's still the boss, mind, but none <laughs> of us had seen him during, during the lockdown situation. So he phoned me up one morning and said, listen, man, come by me. You come, bring Roger, bring Butch, and play out in, the, in, the, um, in my garden, in the front garden. We can socially distance, you can do everything. I shield him, but I can, I can distance. And so said, so done. And it was amazing because that street that he lives in, they got a choir living in the street. They got a, a, a string quartet living in the street. The street is full of musicians. So I think Hallam just wanted to put, put the trump card. He just wanted to show everybody, well, this is what I do. So we, so we went out there and started playing in the, in, in the garden, which was, which was brilliant because it, just, it was two, two things at once. It was seeing Hallam and seeing Hallam doing what he and we all enjoy doing. And we were doing that for, you know, when you used to do for the, for the NHS at eight o'clock. So that's what we were doing. On two occasions, we went out there and did that. So that, that was good. Yeah. Wow, that's so beautiful. <laughs> um, well, I have a, one final question, and then maybe I'll pass it to Rob. What is your, what's the future? What is your vision of Stilpan? Well, with the COVID and what, what has just happened, I'm not sure, because a lot of different things have been thrown up. For instance, all these schools that have got pans in the schools, generally, we're in a little um, tight area, space is a problem, this, that, and the other, but we manage. That's the way it was before COVID. But now we've got to social distance, pans have got to be wiped down now, it's a whole lot of different things, like the sticks and the beaters that the kids are using have got to be wiped down, and we're entering into a different phase because, I mean, the, the pans that we play in the professional band are chromed, but not all the schools can afford the chrome stuff. So they've got painted pans. So in which case, if you're wiping them down with an alcohol type sanitizer, is that going to affect the, the, the paint work? Is it going to, you know, is a whole lots of different questions that I'm constantly being asked, particularly over the last couple of weeks with a view to classes starting back, you know, but a lot of it, I haven't got the answer. I like, I can tell you what to do, but if it's going to affect the pan, I don't know, because we've never had to actually go down this route. Mm. In terms of gigs, a lot of the gigs, the professional gigs that we would play on as Rainbow, are then being cancelled, your weddings, your Bath and West, even St. Paul's Carnival, you name it. This all, everything's been at a standstill, as we all know. So how it picks up, if it picks up, what shape it takes when it picks up, don't know. Even us practising here, like, I mean, well, Rob, you would know. You know, you know the congestion that we work in in here. But now this has all got to be cleared as clear as possible, and designated spaces for like myself and Melvin, Roger, and so forth. Everybody would have their designated space as to try and social distance, hand sanitizer all over the place, and, and look, I ain't like look, 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 <laughs> sanitizer and all these sort of different things, like everything that 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 the government are recommending you to do we've got to take on board and just try and get through this really so the actual future of pan i don't know i think it, i think it's safe but it's going to be different to how it was yeah we have to get to a place don't we because i think it's the same with all culture it's the mob yeah. anything that involves gathering theater people pubs you know where people that uh, could get together and be stronger either as a big political force or as an orchestra you know bring a rabble of you know, kids who might get into trouble, which I noticed in the film, in a sense, what I was hearing from Roger was that if you guys didn't have those to look up to, and you were, you know, then, you know, you were, they driving, you know, they were disciplined, they were about, they took it very seriously, they valued what they did. But you guys, who knows where you guys could have ended up. So all of that, community, culture, mob, audience, <laughs> is very much under threat, isn't it? But, I mean, it's, I mean, how could you play or anything orchestral or anything like that, virtually, it's just, you know, it's about being in the space together. It's about catching a vibe. It's about, you know, I, I, I think that's a lot of cultural things, sports, everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just because um, people are asking um, about maybe where can they find out a bit more if they were interested in music and especially in the steel pan. Is there, have you got a website? Do you run classes for community uh, once lockdown is over? Is there somewhere people can find you? 
Well, we, we are based here in Bath at Percy Community Centre in, in New King Street. Um, there have been classes, but then the funding ran out, so no more classes. Um, again, everything will be reshaped once we get through this next period with, with lockdown and all the rest of it. Once we get through this, then things will be reshaped and hopefully we, we take off again and, and do what we do, you know? But that, that's where we're based. Okay. Well, I just wanted, I mean, I don't know if Rob, you've got anything to add. Um, so maybe we start wrapping up. Um, Toussaint, thank you so, so much for joining us today. It's been really amazing uh, to hear the story. Seeing that documentary was just amazing. Um, and I would love to take this conversation again at some point. Um, you will, maybe you will. You, you will have this conversation. You know why? <laughs> You're going to buy the drinks. I'm yes, gonna, I am. <laughs> I'd talk, I'd talk, I'd talk. So there's no problem. <laughs> and I want to hear the still pan. So if I'm buying the drinks, I have to hear the music. Dialogue. Dialogue. The tune named Dialogue. <laughs> yes. So this is um, definitely, we will need to, to carry on this dialogue. This is just the start uh, of reconnecting. Um, maybe we will see you back, maybe at Carnival in St. Paul's next year. Who knows? Well, hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, thank you so much as well for joining us and for sharing um, your film with us. Uh, I think a lot of people with the comments have been really finding the storyline yeah. uh, really um, important to share. Um, just to remind people that if they want to share the, the Vimeo, the film is staying on Vimeo, so you can share that to, to your friend, family. Uh, and we do recommend to share it widely too, so more people are aware of still banned. And re Alexander's question, how would people be able to see this recording? Is that a possibility? Well, we haven't spoken to, to Sarah about the, how we use it, so okay, um, yeah. we are recording it, um, but we need to speak to Tusa that is, uh, is happy for us to, to share it uh, after today. So I will be, we'll be posting on the BSWN Facebook, what's where they can find out a bit more about um, about today recording. Okay. okay, thank you. So, in answer to Alexander's question, you can um, watch the film again, like Christelle says, which is the film that we were talking about. Well, the film about Rainbow Steel. You can watch that again, and that that link is in the cute uh, in the chat somewhere, or you can, I guess, email us for it if you can't get hold of it. I say it's in the email, isn't it? Watch the film here. It's on the flyer. Yeah, we'll watch that film. Uh, we, uh, we will post it again um, just to remind people, uh, and we will we will send a, a follow up email to everybody who sign up, uh, and I will give you more information. Um, unless anybody else has got any question, I would suggest that we we say our goodbyes. Well, is there a final word you would like to say? Merci beaucoup. And thanks, Colin. I to thank Colin Thomas very much and apologize as well for showing the wrong version. But actually, the good thing about showing the wrong version, you can see how good the, sec the second version was. <laughs> so, and thanks for going through the trouble of getting it to us as well and for joining us. And thanks everyone for joining us as well. Do you have uh, some final words? For yeah, um, Rob, I mean, again, I would really like to see that film in its entirety because, as I say, I was, I was in it. But I, I would just like to see it because every time we've been trying to get film from the BBC footage we've always well we've never got it I think you've been you you've tried as well to try and get it and you know, we've not got it so this is the first time I'm actually seeing this from but all back in that time if, so the, um, if you arrange a wider screening I know Colin is listening so maybe this is a conversation we can take with Colin but actually well, I'll tell you what Rob 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 okay. you can buy the drinks you buy <laughs> the drinks Rob no, no right? Chris and, buy the drinks we've agreed that already but, and, and, and we're all buying Colin the drink, that's for sure. But also, right. um, this is the conversation in the sense, this does fit into the question, because you're right, there's lots of really good assets in the BBC. Um, but then Colin was, was an employee of the BBC in 1968, so he doesn't own the film either. So if right, right. we have it, so legitimately, we can't really promote it legitimately because we don't have license. However, that doesn't mean a strategic approach with BSWN or with partners, um, uh, looking at the BBC, looking at films like this as cultural assets within this context is, is, is not a possibility. So that's something that we could probably do. 
Right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you to Sampos Carnival for giving us a platform to, to host this event today. Uh, thank you to my colleague at BSWN as well for supporting us behind the, the scene. It's uh, been, thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. I know it's uh, late in the week, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, and Robin, to start, again, thank you so, so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to have you here and I hope to see you both very soon. Thank you, Christo. No thank problem. You. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.